Uh, is everything working? You know, nobody ever talks about, well, well, people who do it talk about all the, the times you, you have to do shit when you don't want to do it. <laughs> Welcome you're, to our show. We don't want to be here today. Then, but no, you're talking about we just don't feel good is what you're saying. Okay? Yeah. So it has nothing to do with. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with like our show in general, but like. We just it's, don't it's, have the energy. Yeah, we it's just one of those days where you, where you'd rather you know blow the blow it off like. Yeah. Well, it's a Saturday. Yeah, it's Saturday. In the afternoon. Yeah, so that's that's a Friday episode right there. We can talk about that next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, just dive in. Clothes on and everything. Your phone's in your pocket. Just just dive in dive in yeah to what like it doesn't matter how you feel whatever you yeah just, you have to do you're it you're diving in you have to do it because if you take off every time you don't want to do something it's you never get there yeah i i know a lot of people who go home every day and just sit there and watch tv and talk about i'll get to that tomorrow yeah i think the secret is figuring out how to uh ramp up like, you need ways of eventually getting there, or, you know what I mean? Like, you can't just, you know, snap a finger and you're there. Uh, so you need ways of, like, you and I have developed, uh, like, we, we start having a conversation, or you make fun of me, or something, or we pick a topic yeah. that'll get one of us going. Well, I make fun of you to cheer myself up. Right. And then it makes me laugh. Does it really? Which is weird. That's self-loathing right there, man. Yeah. You might want to talk to somebody about that. <laughs> I've done... I'm, I'm already talking <laughs> with people and it just seems to not go anywhere. Uh, it's a guy that comes over to my house and... He just... Someone's, I, someone's here? No. But there's a guy that comes to visit me a therapy guy, whatever, and and he's just like, how are you doing? Oh, okay, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> nothing. Who, who, is, who is this? I think he's a social worker. And he comes here? To, to oh. see if he can help or see what my problems are, whatever. <laughs> but it's more annoying to me than anything. Well, that's part of your problem. That, you, you see what your problems are, he's... <laughs> I finally got it to where he's going to video call me three times. <laughs> Instead of coming by. Three times a month and only visit once because I just, why are you here? What are we talking about? Yeah. Um, and then the actual, the actual therapist I have, I see them once every three months or something. And it's yeah. like. Okay. How do you summarize in three months all that's... It's not summarized. Uh, trying to, uh, just trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And then... Uh, but I figured it out. Yeah. Uh, but now I just need, like, official diagnosis. <laughs> all right. Psychop I think I'm a psychopath. No. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's weird. I don't like talking with people, especially if we're not... Like, small talk is... Our, our guest just showed up. I hate we're, small talk. Our guest just showed up. We're cheering him up. He's like, you're like, I don't like talking to people, but let's invite him on oh, the show. Oh, no, no, no. I meant, like, <laughs> it's different. When you have a show and you purposefully, like, hey, I want to talk to you, but, like, people that come over to your house... Yeah, screw you... those people. It's true those people. <laughs> Fuck those guys. How you doing? Can you hear us? Can you hear us yeah, all right? I, can I guess hear you. you can. You're sitting here. Yeah. Yeah, there we How go. How's it going? Okay. We're doing good. How about you? I'm doing great. Where where are you at in the world right now? Are you I am in, in uh, Vancouver, 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 Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Uh How about well yours? we're in Orlando, Florida. Nice. And we're we're not nearly as cheerful enough to be 
<laughs> to be in the tourist capital of at least the country, I think. It's October. It's still hot. When is it going to get cold? <laughs> it's cold here. Yeah, it is. What? What's? Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, you guys actually have seasons up there. We do. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky to have seasons. Yeah. Well, we. I don't know if you heard any of our show. I. I don't even know if I sent you a link or anything. We just. We I just haven't. No. Shoot the shit. We just talk filmmaking awesome. stuff. Let's and uh, I didn't even realize the guy who made Shot Lister was also a filmmaker. I don't think I, I don't <laughs> think I knew that until, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I started thinking about oh we should see if that guy wants to come on the show. So yeah. uh, now I'm I a, def- I'm now a, we I'm, definitely I'm a film nerd. So let's just talk about film. Yeah, yeah. We now we definitely <laughs> wanted to talk to you. We heard uh, we heard your I heard your film riot interview and I thought that was cool, oh, cool. too. So it was a little little preview. Um, awesome. So, so you ready to go, Brian? Do you want to just yeah? Dive we need in? to do the whole intro and all that, right? Yeah, we yeah. gotta go to it. We're, let's make sure we spelled names right and everything, and sure. make sure that the graphics say what we the, what you want them to say. No. Does that look right to you? Yeah, that looks great. It's okay, let's show him the thumbnail, Brad. Oh, it's right above him. Oops. No, that's not him. That's him. Yeah. Yeah, looks great. Looks great. Okay, L- Lipovsky, right? Is that how you say your name? Perfect. Zach Lepofsky, okay. I'm Beckemeyer. Whoa. And that's Brad, okay. who goes as the balding Ewok. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well just put it out there. Put what out there? On the dating sites. The, yeah. The balding Ewok. Yeah, you probably get more traction well, you, with the balding Ewok. Well, you would you would get 100 percent of that traffic. I get a, I get way too many furries. They take it seriously. <laughs> That's what we need to be talking about in the intro. Okay, hold I've, on to that. I've never actually been on a dating site. <laughs> they're, they're really... If, uh, if you weren't paying attention to the first part of our conversation, I don't like <laughs> nothing with people. All right, Especially in your house. Yeah, in my not house. In house. Like, what, the <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> All, right, All right, so I'm going to so, take uh, Zach off for yeah, we, a second. We normally we go off and then yeah, we'll yeah. do a full, full screen for a second and then we'll... Yeah. Sure. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. You ready, Brad? Yeah. Oh ready? no! Wrong button. Wrong guy. <laughs> it's the wrong guy. Yeah. Up Kentucky. Look at that. We need to get it, get you a headshot like that, where you're smiling and shit. That's hard to do. That takes a lot of alcohol. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> He's currently going. What did I get myself into? Why do these guys sound so negative? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess you're gonna mute us when you edit this because we've been talking sure. over the thing. Okay. Yeah. So this is silent, and then we're gonna come up. Mm-hmm. Hey. Hello, film reverie listeners. Michael we're so happy to be here. This is <laughs> Beckemeyer. As always, I have the balding you walk yeah. with me. Today we have um, a film. I'm a, gonna get him on. A filmmaker. Uh, our guest is a filmmaker and the creator. Is that what you call yourself? The creator of. Founder yeah. of, Founder, of Shotlister, designer. Yeah. the Shotlister app, and and I'm just like, you know, Brad and I talk a lot about how when you um, set out to be a filmmaker, you end up doing independent filmmaker. All the things yeah. you have to get good at just so you can make a movie, like that you never yeah. thought of. Oh, I thought I never knew I was going to have to design a website or you know whatever <laughs> just so I could make a movie. But totally. how did you say? Uh, I never thought I was gonna have to dev- design a an application so that I could make a movie. Is it a scheduling yeah, well, like I... scheduling blind spots that you ended up just <laughs> wishing wishing were better or? It was sort of out of necessity. I was um, always been a huge nerd and always been you know a yeah. purveyor of everything Mac and apps and you know everything. I just always a huge part of my life has always been computers and then film. Those are basically okay. the two okay. the two parts of my life growing up. I was never necessarily a programmer, but you know, heavily, heavily into design and using as much software as I could to do whatever I was doing. And I was making my first horror film ever. My first time making a, a movie it was a it was a movie for the Sci-Fi Channel. It was a monster film about nine people who get eaten by a giant man Tasmanian devils. Right. And so you just pissed Brad off because Brad loves. <laughs> stories about people's first film being like a thing like our first yeah. film was something no one's ever watched right but your well, first film was for the sci-fi channel okay yeah <laughs> and uh starred danica mckeller from the wonder years with a giant okay. flamethrower roasting man-eating tasmanian devils okay that sounds <laughs> and, like something that would be on the uh, sci-fi channel 
And, uh, you know, I had done lots of shorts and had written movies and had, you know, was trying yeah. to get them going and just nothing yeah. was going. And then I got the opportunity to make this movie and quickly was trying to build a shot list and quickly realized doing some basic math that like, wait, if I'm doing this many shots per page and there's this many pages, I could be up to like a thousand shots here. How am I going to manage this? Like there must yeah. be some way and uh, you know at the time it was just as the ipad had just come out and i looked online and most people were basically just using excel mm -hmm. and then printing out a piece of paper and then going to set with this piece of paper and then you know scratching it off and that's exactly doing yeah, all that yeah. stuff and i was like there's got to be a better way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> there's got to be a piece of software that does this and there it's, wasn't it's, um it's and so crazy, at the time i yeah go ahead no, I was going to say, it's crazy that there never, that there wasn't. I was literally, when I direct something, uh, before, yeah. before we started using, because we used it on our last film. We haven't, we haven't started using sure. it regularly yet. We've only used it the one, one production. But before that, yeah. I was just typing wide shot, one, scene one, one, wide shot so-and-so, yeah. two, yeah. close up. And we would literally just go through and scratch them off. And you're right, yeah. you get to be like 36 well, the with that, shots a day or something like that. I was, I remember once I was, had my piece of paper that I'd been scratching off even yeah. when I was doing short films and had it on leaning, leaning it on the back of my AD because it was the only flat surface nearby, <laughs> trying to do arithmetic in the side of the margin of the piece of paper to try and figure out how much time we had left to figure out how many shots we could do right. within, how many within shots the time had remaining. How many I shots remember thinking, got there's got to be a better way of doing this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and I, with a, doing math on the back of your AD. Was yeah, shot. when we did our first uh, like full feature film and we were doing it basically yeah. the same way and then we ran into situations where we needed to change the order of shots oh, and man. change the the names like the uh, d uh what was it uh scene like one, one a take one, a yeah, and, then it, and then it was like one a a or one a one yeah, or one right. a b and then and then d and then yeah. f and it's like we couldn't change the order yeah. and then Honestly, we lost we track at one head. point, uh, and then we were just like, I don't know, just put a F on it, or a Q, <laughs> for fuck, whatever. F for fuck this, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and I remember, and then uh, I we created an opportunity for me to direct a short film, and and my brain works in a digital way. Like I want to do this yeah. on my phone. I want to look at it on my phone. I want to be yeah. able to change things around yeah. and have the math done for me. And shot lister was right there. And yeah. I, yeah. Well, so I, I had the same thought, but it didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. And then so thank I, you. At the, time, <laughs> yeah. um, the first version for that movie was actually, there's this program called FileMaker, which is basically just like a fancy version of Excel. Mm -hmm. um, and I basically built a version of shot lister using FileMaker um, just for myself. Because at the time, FileMaker had a way of opening those files on your iPad. So I was able oh, to have a FileMaker file that basically was a prototype of Shotlister. And then while I was using it, you know, everyone on set was like, wow, that's amazing. You should, that should be a thing. And then at the same time, while I was making that movie, I was sleeping on the floor of my mom's living room. <laughs> and she was, she used to be a television producer. And she was like, wow, that's incredible. Why, why don't you turn that into a thing? And I was like, well, I don't know how to program and I don't have the money to hire someone to program. And right. she said, well, I have a little bit of money. And so oh. we, we ended up going into business together and she and I still run the company to this day. And yeah. she That's runs awesome. like a, like a producer. She runs all the like management and financials and, you know, yeah. paying the bills and um, does lots of stuff, including now like tech support and stuff. And I do all the designing and, and sort of, you know, figuring out sort of the roadmap of what we're going to do with it and working with customers and all that type of stuff. I can't really imagine going to business, going into business with one of my parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like, yeah, I guess it, I guess if my dad was a filmmaker or a producer of some kind, right. it would, be, well, it would make more, more sense, but my dad's a the, preacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my mom was born, you know, when she went to school, it was before the invention of the ballpoint pen. You know, Holy she shit. was at, she was at school with inkwell. <laughs> <laughs> oh my literally God. feathering quills like, sort of like, stuff yeah. so yeah. harry potter <laughs> time yeah, and, and uh you know now she's the co-founder of a startup so it can anyone you know it, anyone can learn anyway so how long is how long has it been how long uh, when did you when was that when you guys started um 
I don't remember whether the iPhone was 2007, the iPad must have been around, I guess it would have been around 2012, 2013, sometime around yeah. there. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Maybe. So 10 years-ish, wow. yeah. I'm not sure, whenever the first iPad was, maybe it was a bit earlier, yeah. Yeah, that's cool, that's cool. So, but you you mentioned your mom was a producer, so yeah. you that that means you grew you must have grown up around yeah I grew up production on set. So of, I was, of some kind is my that mom how was you a, became interested yeah my mom gave up her life being a hippie and a potter and uh, going from craft fairs to realizing was, shit <laughs> shit I got three kids and no money and I've always liked she always wanted to be a director but right. so she went to she went to school when she was in her mid thirties and trained as a producer and got a job at it, sort of a local um, television channel that's sort of the community access channel and was yeah. making TV, TV shows there. And she was making kids shows and needed kids that she didn't have to pay. So she hired me. And uh, so I basically grew up on, on uh, film sets as a kid and then quickly started liking it. And eventually I was, um, got an agent and was basically an actor while I was a kid. Right. So I was about to say, what did you start yeah. as an actor then? Okay. And then, but pretty soon, you know, when I was like 10 years old, I got the very first, cause I had some money from acting, um, that I could buy equipment. So mm -hmm. I actually bought the very first digital still camera that Sony made that took floppy disks. So the whole side of the camera would open and you put in a you put in a floppy disk and close it. And I don't it even remember this, but I yeah. know I was alive for it. Okay. Wow. Okay. And, and and I would do stop motion animation with it. Um, it would it could take thirty six forty by four eighty images, and then you have to open it and take the floppy out and put yeah, in a, a new, new, a new floppy. And I didn't have a, tri a tripod, so I'd have to do it without moving the camera so that the animation would keep working. You know, half the people listening don't even know what a floppy disk is. <laughs> Maybe even more than half. My, yeah. I teach TV. I teach TV production. I don't. I'm yeah. gonna ask my students on Monday. Do you guys know what a floppy disk is? And I bet you they'll be like, no. Yeah, it's you the know. save icon. You know, the thing you click yeah, on when you hit save. Yeah, the save icon. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's like, that is what the floppy disk is turned into. It's the save yeah. icon. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just like the phone icon. No yeah. one knows what that thing is anymore. No one anyway, knows what that thing is. Um, and so I kind of grew up. I was sort of lucky to grow up, basically, as the digital revolution was taking off. Uh -huh. I was just starting to get this sort of, you know, Final Cut Pro 1, you know, yeah. the first mini DV camera and just sort of worked, you know, started making movies and it's all I ever wanted to do and and just kind of worked my way up. Do you remember when Final Cut 1, Final Cut Pro 1 came out and everybody was still kind of shitting on it because it wasn't the Media 100 or something like that? <laughs> or, the Avid. or the Avid. And I'm like, and I was yeah. like, no, I'm, if I... It, that it may it's what made it's where the the early adopter thing came in for me it's right. like yeah i'm gonna start using this final cut pro thing and people are like okay but you know it's not going to be a thing and i'm like i think it's going to be a thing but i you know totally. it's not like i was telling the future anymore. yeah it was so obviously better yeah you know, just the ability to to have sort of truly free nonlinear editing in a way yeah, that yeah, was yeah. more drag and drop than visual it was so it was so uh, cool. That's what, and I learned how to edit on videotape, like videotape, oh, like yeah. linearly That's in right. order, and it was uh, it was fun. I loved I I always yeah. loved editing, strangely enough. And then when nonlinear became a thing, I it took me a long time to actually start cutting in a nonlinear way because I was still like shot right. one shot, two drop that in the timeline. Yeah, just so made, I was lucky because I basically started just as nonlinear was a possibility. Yeah. That's basically the moment I started. So. I try to explain to my film, my students about how they like had to cut, literally cut. That's where the word comes from, film. Yeah. And they're like, I would never do that. <laughs> well, if you love it enough, you'll do it because you love it, you know. Yeah. But they don't love it. They want to just shoot stuff on, on their iPhones. Yeah. But um, okay, so then you so you started out as a as a child actor. Working for that's like slave labor, working for free for your <laughs> Well, eventually I, I started was, getting paid. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And you <laughs> grew up and you started uh, tinkering and you became a filmmaker. Yeah. So, because um, even when I wasn't acting, like she was a single mom, so I was sleeping yeah. under the avid while she was, you know, yeah. editing. I was on set while she was, you know, didn't have daycare. So I grew up around all that. Do you think that growing up around it just made it seem like more? like a just a thing people did to you yeah well because a lot of people discuss i know from a lot of other people's origin stories and a lot of my friends like there's the moment they realize wait people make content like you know a lot yeah, of people yeah, have yeah. a moment where they're they're watching star wars and the credits roll and they go wait 
who are those people? Yeah. Wait, someone actually came up with this? And then yeah. they start going down that path. Whereas for me, that was always just, I always knew that people made it because that's basically yeah. what I was doing all day. So yeah. I, it was very normal to me. And I also had a, and my mom was super supportive. So yeah. I never had that sort of battle of having to first discover that it was a thing and then mm-hmm. prove to my parents that I should be allowed to do it. Um, yeah. So I, that, I had a very, you know, straight, straight path all the way through. I started as a music major. And when I, when I decided that I was going to be a filmmaker, it felt like a very strange thing to say out loud because it felt like I was telling people I was going to go live in a fairy tale land. Right. Uh, I don't want to live in the real world. I want to go. And that was true. I did not want to live in the real world. I wanted to go make movies, but it's like Steven Spielberg says, I dream for a living. That's what I do or something like that. Um, But it, it felt like, how am I going to, you know, so for a long time, I like held off on even getting a job. It's like, I'm going to be a director. I'm not going to, not going to work. And my grandfather who grew up during the depression was sort of looking at me like, I was like, these kids are fucking lazy today. Like, he doesn't even <laughs> want to work. No, it's hard work, but I, you know, yeah. but it felt like a strange thing to say out loud. And it almost felt like, uh, it did feel like saying, I'm going to, I want to be an artist for a living. And you know that, you know, all the stories you hear about artists when you are growing up are people that yeah. became famous after they died penniless. Right. You know, like Paul. Well, there's Jack's this quote Pollock. that, um, I'm a co-director now with my best friend and there's a quote that he always says about how like in America, there's nothing America hates more than an unsuccessful artist, but there's nothing they love more than a successful artist. (laughs) (laughs) That is very true. So uh, that's, so you, 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 when did you start working with your co-director friend? Cause you, Oh, I I heard a little bit about your movie freaks that you is freaks, right? That you guys started to do sort of like the 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 cavalry is not coming to save you Definitely. concept, yeah. and then somehow accidentally raised close to a million dollars. Like everybody <laughs> hates you <laughs> because oh yes, yeah. this just happened. I, you know. Well, I think the so we so he and I at his name's Adam Stein. We um we actually met in a very unique way, which is we were contestants against each other on a reality television show. Yeah, uh, this is on the which lot. was on the lot, which was a yeah. TV show that Steven Spielberg um, yeah. made on Fox, uh-huh. and it was basically Amer- American Idol but for film. Was the yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, I watched yeah. that. Yeah, and so he and I were contestants, and we were yeah. basically had to make a movie every week, and America would vote, and if you sucked, you would go home, and we became sort of best friend, best friends through that, and um, just you know we weren't working together, but we were each yeah. other's sort of closest allies and helping yeah. each other and and uh, just kind of collaborating whenever possible. And then slowly we, we started doing, you know, like little 40 hour film festival things where we would uh-huh. co-direct, co-write. Yeah. And then we did a web series together and we started really, really enjoying uh-huh. that collaboration. Um, and then we really just got to a place where both of us were really feeling the same feeling, which was yeah. no matter what we do, we can't get these movies made. <laughs> we're writing all these movies yeah. that no one wants to make we're pitching on all these movies that no one wants us to make. Sometimes we're even getting attached to movies, but then as soon as the movie starts going, they fire us and get someone bigger because now it's actually happening. No, it's and actually it was just happening. like the world felt so, <laughs> yeah. it just felt basically impossible to get a movie made that we that was truly ours. Like yeah. we've got these occasional things like that monster movie I was telling you guys about mm-hmm. where I, we would, I'd, figure a way to get hired to make a movie for someone else. But as far as making your own movie that you really feel passionate about, that is a real expression of who you are, it just was never happening. And so we decided to start, We, like you mentioned, we saw that speech from Mark Duplass, that he, a very famous speech he gave called The Cavalry's yeah. Not Coming, where he basically just gives you the step-by-step you know, outline of how to make a movie that you control yeah. all the way from the script stage. And we just started following his steps and that basically led to Freaks. Really? So you actually put into action that fifteen Every that hour long yeah. speech. Yeah. And it so you're so did when I originally heard that many a long time ago, I just thought I thought that sounds cool and I love I love it. You know what I mean? I love what he's saying, but it almost sounds like it sounded maybe like maybe he was pulling some of it out of his ass. He's like, Here's what you go here's what you're saying, but he's like somebody's talking from currently on the other side. Right. Sure. You know, for the rest of us. But uh, it's interesting to hear you say you followed it. I mean, 
every short film he and I have ever made together and separate has mostly, except for one, has been made for like no money. Sure. Uh, friend here, friend there, uh, you know, spent money to feed the crew for the day yeah. or two while we were there. And uh, I, I did one short film where we, we raised some money, like we, and we did a full crew and blah, blah, blah. And that also, I'm still sitting here in Orlando. It's not like, so <laughs> the concept of making a movie for, for nothing is like, right, because unless you have a bajillion dollars to help market the thing and everything, you're still sure. making a movie that not many people are going to hear of. But and making the f- movie for nothing is only like step three of seven or something. Right. So there's many, right, there's right. many, so he gives many steps right. after that, that, yeah. um, yes. that are really yeah. important as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the $3, I think he called it the $3 short film. Is that what he calls it? The $5 yeah. short film. Yeah. 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 So, um, so t- talk about on the lot, because I think at the time it didn't, I don't know if the show itself clicked with general audiences because no, yeah. making movies a... is fucking boring to people that <laughs> don't make movies. Well, I and, think they, they made a critical mistake, which is the, and I know exactly why they made it, which is, at the time, you know, the biggest reality producer in the world was Mark Burnett. The yeah. biggest director in the world was Steven Spielberg. And American Idol was the most popular show on television. So the idea was to combine those three things. Yeah. Have Ameri- an American Idol style show on Fox being produced by Mark Burnett with Steven Spielberg. But those, yeah. those three Id- entities had very different goals. Spielberg, Mark Burnett wanted to make The Apprentice which is a much more entertaining format for this type of thing where you're actually, it's not a live show. They actually show the making of, and they show all the ups and downs and they make sort of, you know, the drama Mm -hmm. out of, out of the process of making it. That's sort of, you know, in some of the apprentice without, without, you know, Trump, but it would be Spielberg instead. And then, but American Idol, which is a live show is, was the most popular show on TV. So they wanted a live, but, we're not performing. We're just standing on stage going, Talking about. hi, uh, here's the, yeah. um, the movie I made this week. And then, you know, some judges being like, loved it, hate it. And then mm-hmm. the live show element took up so much of the time that the films had to be incredibly short. And then the reality packages is what they called them, which are sort of the making of packages before each film. Yeah. Spielberg said he only wanted the show to celebrate film and not to be trashy in the way that it, like it did not to have that sort of reality show drama. Yeah. And so um, Mark Burnett wasn't allowed to make the reality show stuff have all that juiciness yeah. that makes reality yeah. shows entertaining. And so it was the, the like smut, reality. Sh- <laughs> it would have been yeah. better that way though. Yeah, yeah the so, filmmakers are like arguing and yelling at each other and snatching their so hair weaves It was out basically like, like a, a live show with people that weren't that interesting on stage with reality show bits that had no nothing to them other than I made a movie this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then us showing a movie and they would only be two minutes long and some of them be good and some of them would be bad and right. some get knocked off. So it wasn't Maybe that. Maybe two of them were good and the yeah. rest were right. like, eh. Well, so, how, long, how far did you make it into the show? How far did you make it into the competition? Yeah, so I made it to fifth, which out of like, you know, the it was like 16 or 12, something. 12, 12,000 12. people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, the, yeah. They started that, I think the first episode was 50 people. But yeah, 50 I came people. in fifth. Adam, wow. my co-director, came in third. Um, and uh, yeah, we had the time of our lives. You know, for us, That's it was awesome. Cool. It was like That's the cool. ultimate, yeah. su- it was like the ultimate yeah. film summer camp where you got to make a movie every week. Yeah, a different every, genre with you got a budget, and, right? Like they gave you money and equipment money and all to, that. And... To pull the stuff it was out. basically, I mean, it was behind the scenes, it would have been such an, a more amazing thing to witness. Because imagine shooting six films with full crews, like you would yeah. have on a feature film. And probably, in six... a way that, probably in a way that you hadn't really even done a lot of right. before. Yeah, right. yeah. So there's a and, learning curve there, dealing with like a But then they also had crew. six crews filming those six crews, right? <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> and the so they would money. have... <laughs> They had, you know, there was like maybe 500 crew on this thing because they would yeah. find a lo- they would find a location where they could film six movies that looked totally different, have one mega base camp, and stagger all the crews by half an hour. So one crew would arrive for breakfast, and then start go off to shoot, and the next crew would arrive for breakfast and go off and shoot, and then lunch would happen on this rolling thing. So lunch would last for like, you know, however long, four hours, as as yeah. all these crews would come and go to lunch and all the transport trucks. It was like this amazing thing to witness. 
um, and to be a part of. So if you're sitting here working on your, your film, Freaks, and you started out... By the way, I watched every episode of that show. So I've oh, cool. seen you before, and I've seen your short films before. I just it when you when you mentioned it, I I just hadn't I can't place them. I'm sure I've saw them. Yeah. I saw them though. Uh, I was sitting on the floor in my uh, living room, petting my dog, watching your show. I guess my <laughs> daughter, my daughter was like three or four at the time. I remember she was very little when I was watching that. Um, so you're sitting there, you're working on your your movie Freaks, and you have a co-director who is your best friend, yeah. uh, when you guys have an argument, how do you settle the argument? Is it, well, I came in third place on, on the line, <laughs> you came in fifth, so I, I, I've seen He's you already better. here, so yeah. sit yeah, down do you, better. do you pick one person that, uh, if you both are disagreeing, that person has veto power? Or, I don't yeah. know. No, we, you know, it's really interesting. It's something that's developed, I mean, it's kind of the main reason we've decided to co-direct and co-write, yeah. is that, quickly, you know, we both had directed a lot separately. Yeah. Um, and there's a certain amount of control that comes with that because just whatever decision you make is the decision that gets made. Yeah. But there's also a certain amount of blindness that comes from that because you only have your perspective and sometimes you miss stuff and sometimes yeah. you stick with the decision even though you shouldn't just because it was your decision. Yeah. Um, and depending on the collaborators you have around you, that can, that can be dangerous. Whereas often, you know, from a starting line, we have the same taste. So like what we want to make is the same. So yeah. in general, you know, we both get excited about 90% of the same stuff we want to make, you know, so most of the decisions are the same. As soon as someone says it, we, we both go, oh my God, that would be so great. Um, but there are definitely, you know, 10% of the time where we see it differently. Yeah. Um, and almost in every case where we see it differently, it's always really interesting that we see it differently. Oh, like, and it happens at all different stages at the screenwriting, all the way down to the blocking, all the way down to where yeah. the camera should be. Most of the time we see it exactly the same, but in the times where we don't, yeah. it's usually really for a very, very real, like interesting reason. Like, oh, I'm so surprised you thought it would be here. I thought it would be here. Yeah. And what we And what we do in that moment is we say, well, why is it important to you that it's here? What is being yeah. here? Or what does this idea achieve that this idea doesn't? Well, I to me, it's really important that in this scene, this happens, or that we communicate this. And then he'll say, well, for me in this scene, it's really important that this happens, or this, you know. Mm -hmm. And we then very quickly, usually what happens is we just go, well, what's an idea that would achieve both those things? Both, yeah, no, and, yeah. And, the, and the third idea is always better than the individual ideas. And usually, the reason we saw it differently is because there was some problem that we hadn't yet identified, mm -hmm. either in the structure or organization of what we were trying to achieve, it had some inherent flaw that was leading to two possible outcomes that were wildly different. And usually the third option that we come up with ends up being far better and fixing whatever that problem was that we that we both hadn't realized. That's um, uh, then, seek first sometimes, to understand and to be yeah. understood. You know, Stephen Covey right. talks about synergy being one yeah. plus one equals three. That's like yeah. the two things being better totally. than, yeah, yeah, it's cool. I mean, sometimes there's the you can just shoot both things. Yeah. Uh, you sometimes you can things. try both performances if it's if it's easy. Yeah. But generally, the third option we always we actually started becoming excited every time we disagree. Yeah. Uh, it's it you have to really put your ego to the side. Like you yeah. have to find someone where you have no ego with, and then you get into the habit of basically every time this happens and you see a better result, you start realizing, wait, this is a better way of working yeah. than doing it by myself. Because the outcome is better than I would have come up with by myself. You know, the, uh, the Cohen brothers, uh, they, they've done it together. Like, they, you, yeah. you'd see them and they're like, they're finishing each other's sentences. Like, they have right. a mind meld. But, yeah. you know, they're, the, they're not, and the Wachowskis, they also, yeah. they're, they both have split up now to where, right. not, may, probably not, maybe not permanently, but, you know, right. uh, Macbeth, Macbeth is being directed by just one of the Cohens, and it's weird. Because I'm like, and the Matrix is just one. Of the and the Matrix is just you one. You mean Wachowski's? Wachowski's. Cohen? Well, the Cohen brothers also. The the tragedy of Macbeth is oh, just, oh. just just one. And the other one, just like I don't want to do it. Like now, yeah. like thirty years later, you're like I don't want to do this one. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah. um, it, so it must be weird. What do you do? You feel like you would, you know, at some point go? I'm gonna do this by myself. Not right like now. You guys, 
Yeah, that um, right now. Yeah. There's there's such it's so much fun to do what we do with your best yeah. friend. So like see, having see, this is what having, you're missing. You're not making it you're not making on? it fun enough. I don't <laughs> want to be around you enough to keep doing yeah, I'm the energy <laughs> vampire. <laughs> and I need you to bring it and I suck it out of you and then right. we're like And I'm trying, but I've got this succubus sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um but yeah, uh, we you know, we get twice as much done, we we yeah. have twice as much fun, we it's twice as rewarding to share it with yeah, you, know, you find share it's those less moments, pressure you know? because you know that uh, you band of brothers. the other person yeah. can help you solve the problem. Like, there's no problem you, can over, you can't overcome. Yeah, I mean, it's not... And, there's always stressful moments, but it's always so helpful yeah. to have someone you can yeah. go to the side and be like, I'm not insane, right? That person's being a total asshole? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> right, like, right. <laughs> like, what are we going to do about it? Okay, you go deal with that, and I'll do it. Like, it's just like, you know, having the ability to kind of have someone that you know always has your back especially yeah. as a director because sometimes as a director you're parachuting in to something yeah and you don't know all the politics and and exactly what you're getting into yeah. and so having someone that you're there with <laughs> yeah, yeah, can yeah. be very very helpful yeah do you, i just have one last question on this co-directing um do you ever find that uh, that uh the actors uh will sometimes lean more towards one than the other as far as like direction kids, like, like they'll kids pick... where they pit you against mom and dad like well he said <laughs> yeah, this well, think... so what <laughs> yes so crew mostly it's crew crew are very yeah. very eager for any opportunity to point out that it's worse because there's two of you they're very they're like they're like they can't wait they're all like on their ready yeah. to because sh- it's very yeah, unusual for them to have one funny. director so they're waiting for the moment until they can say ah aha see he said this and you said that so this is terrible we shouldn't have had two of you, we um, have had two of you. <laughs> and so we've never had that with actors um now we yeah. do a lot of things we've worked on this quite a bit to to mitigate um confusion because they're the one yeah. benefit of having one person is you have one voice and so yeah. miscommunication is less likely because every conversation that's happened you were there for and you gave yeah. the direction for um now when there's two people especially if we're not physically in the same space for whatever reason and someone goes oh hey uh, i was just wondering should we do this or that and you tell someone and then they go off to start doing that and then my my co-director was unaware and then walks over and goes you idiot why are you painting that red it was supposed to be blue and then they say well my, yeah. you're the other director said it should be red and, um, so we've done a lot of different things to make sure that that doesn't happen. So every time I have a conversation with someone where he's not around, as soon as I see him, I tell him, by the way, I told John it's going to be blue. I told this person it's going to be that and blah, blah, blah. What have you been yeah. doing? I've yeah. been doing this and blah, 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 so that we're all, we're all, we're all, we're in sync. We even now on bigger shows now, we have our own radio channel so that we can be, if we're separated, we can be communicating yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah. Okay. Um, but also yeah. like we make sure that for the actors, we've found that as a director, you often want to be right next to the camera with the actors. Like you want to be sort of right at the front in the moment, but then you're not at the monitors and not with all the people that paid are paying the bills and all the getting the notes and all the crew. You often want to be at the monitors and at the camera. And so what we do is every scene, we split that up. So one of us will be up front and one of us will be back mm-hmm. at the, at the monitors. And whoever is the one that's up front is the sort of the voice to the crew and the voice to the actors for that scene. So usually it's that person will block the scene. So they'll walk the crew through the scene and the actors through the scene and they're communicating everything that's going to happen in that scene. And any crew that comes and asks a question, they know to go to that person. Whereas the other one of us is sort of the phantom of the opera, sort of lurking in the shadows, watching from from 300 feet up, looking at the monitors, and basically just observing which which you can which is super helpful and then if there's a change a change we want to make we go up to the other director and say hey yeah i think we should do this and then that person communicates it it's like so quality, it helps. the other one's quality control and it notices right. something and it's like right. oh okay let me i know so like, this yeah. there's a scene at the end of freaks where the main character the little girl is bawling her eyes out you know under this giant pile of rubble and yeah and you know, Adam was under the rubble with her, crying with her, you know, a foot away from her face, not knowing what we were recording at all, but just, you know, getting getting her yeah. into that space and getting yeah. the footage. And then, he, you know, after a 
20 minute take climbs out of this rubble it looks at me and is like did we get anything like did we <laughs> did yeah we did it happen and, yeah. you know yeah. and i was like we got perfect we nailed it so but yeah. he had no idea right so having being in two places at once can be really a superpower uh well so how did how did being on way back what was that 10 years was, was uh on the lot it was, it was at in least 10, 2007 10 yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's while almost ago. fifteen. Yeah. How did that help you help your boost your career at all? Like, I I realized the show didn't do all that great, but there were you had a you know millions of people. I don't know how many millions of people watching your stuff. Like you were like physically on the map from that from yeah. that point on. How did it? Is that what helped you get your your the sci fi gig, or were you already working? No, actually. And, um, I you know I was the youngest guy on that show. I was 22 at the time. It was uh -huh. my first time being in LA. I basically you know had made short films, but that was it. Yeah. Um, it was sort of the most amazing spotlight at the worst time in history, which was basically it was the summer of 2007, which yeah. went into the fall of 2007, which was the writer strike. So yeah. all of Hollywood completely shut down, and then at the end of the writer strike, we went into 2008, which was the recession. And all yeah. of the stock markets collapsing, so all of the financing for movies collapsed. So basically, yeah. from like 2007 to like 2011, you know, basically the film industry was on really rocky ground. Yeah. Um, and so I basically didn't work for like four or five years. Oh. Um, and uh, I was doing a lot of stuff. I was writing scripts. I was taking meetings. I mean, the the main yeah. thing I got out of the show, which I still have, is is I got an agent. Um, uh, and same same person, same same agent. Yeah, I still yeah, have him okay. now. And, and your so, best friend, obviously. And my best friend. So, yeah, yeah. Having, so getting, getting representation and a collaborator yeah. was li life changing. But it yeah. didn't, you know, it was one of those moments where people are like, you're going to be directing a $100 million movie in six months. Yeah. Um, but that didn't happen. The guy who won that show, what, what was it? What was the prize? It was a million dollar development deal with DreamWorks, I think it was, right? Yeah. It was, yeah. It was like $500,000 $500, cash and then $500,000 yeah. development. Okay, yeah. okay. So, how do, do you know what happened with that guy? I've looked him up a couple of times and I don't, I don't know. I yeah. Can't uh, his name I mean, same thing. He, his name was Will. Uh, yeah. He, same thing. He got a $500,000 development deal at a moment where it was, like, you couldn't develop because there was a writer. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he, he had an office at DreamWorks and, and worked there for, I think a year or so. And um, I don't think anything, ultimately came from that and then he ended up um making an indie film and you know just kind of going back to trying to, to do the hustle okay. yeah i wonder if it kind of feels like or felt like a uh well you said you got an agent so i'm sure he did too like you know yeah. you get make it that far in that show so i'm get, i'm sure that that really helped but it it almost felt it's like that mark duplass speech where he's like look you're gonna get there, and they're gonna tell you the Calvary's coming, and then you get there, and you like, you do, you take it's that so gig. True. You're gonna be in development hell for a year, and then you're yeah. still gonna to have to be like, what am I gonna do next? And you have to go back and do your thing, kind of like yeah. you're, you're saying. You always, literally, I've, I've listened to that speech so many times, and I always <laughs> continue to not do what he says in that speech, and I yeah. always continue to think the Calvary's coming, <laughs> and every time they're not coming. Every because time. nobody nobody sets out to be a filmmaker a filmmaker that doesn't have optimism and hope because we're right. like this is gonna be the, the this is gonna change right. the fucking world we're gonna change right. the we're gonna save the universe here's our movie boom and then it like it's like right. crickets <laughs> you know yeah yeah totally and and there's this whole massive industry of people with really impressive posters on their wall yeah uh, that are saying they want to work with you. Yes, and you love their movies, and this is a this is the dream coming true. And then yeah. you you walk into this thing, and you it takes years to realize none of these people actually make movies. They're all just sort of <laughs> keeping the this facade like, of this machine that makes movies going. But yeah, yeah. like gatekeepers. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So, like right now, like we still pursue you know opportunities as they come along, but we yeah. basically do it knowing the chances are still like one yeah. in a million that these are going to lead to something while on the side continuing to write and create our own stuff and yeah. and basically still do the defloss thing on the side well are you so your film uh freaks came out was it 2019 20 2019 yes how, how it did on, it came on netflix last year 2020 yeah oh is it on netflix right now yeah 
It is. I, yeah. It's in it my Netflix well. queue. I, I, have, I haven't got yeah. it. <laughs> so um, I, I didn't. talk about that. Did you get, uh, were you working with a distributor that sold a bunch of things to Netflix or how did right. that yeah. process work? Yeah. Okay. So we, you know, we made this indie film. We made it without having a distributor on board. We just made this movie. Yeah. And we were able to get it. We got all these rejections and eventually we got it into the Toronto Film Festival. Yeah. And then we were able to get it sold at the Toronto Film Festival to a small yeah. distributor. Um, uh, and they they bought it. They put it in some theaters when they released it. But then mostly that they make most of their money from home video and mm -hmm. selling it to, you know, to streamers and stuff. So they they sold it to, to Netflix And the way that most of these deals happen to Netflix when Netflix gets um, a bunch of movies that they didn't make. Yeah. You know, when they when they get stuff that they didn't make it's they buy like packages of movies and they'll you know and usually the distributors will say well, if you want this movie that everyone really wants you've got to buy these 10 other movies that yeah. nobody wants you know they kind yeah. of that's how they kind of buy in bulk and so we yeah. were one of those movies that that they didn't want <laughs> but they you know they sold it that must have felt good <laughs> well the funny thing was then our movie when they put it on exploded in popularity once I they was had gonna they say. did put it on yeah. There's a lot of, like, I watched, There's I think it was Film Connection as a YouTube uh, show where the guy recommends films, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's how I came across it. There, there was so a you lot didn't of, come across it because talk, uh, talking no, about him, you already had it in like, your Yeah, film. back then I heard about yeah. it, yeah. and it, it was, I don't, I guess, I don't know if it was a lot of word of mouth, but it was like, oh, okay, yeah. that yeah. sounds yeah. impressive, I'll put that in my queue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, we were great, it was lucky, we had a lot of, a lot of buzz around the film, it, it had you know, 90% of Rotten Tomatoes. It had lots of genre genre yeah. places talking nice. about it. Um, it just, the theatrical release was very small and didn't really, wasn't in the right place. And so no one could really see it when all the buzz was happening. But yeah. then once it did land on Netflix, I think Netflix was surprised that all that buzz was sort of sitting there. Yeah. And then it, it yeah. ended up becoming the number two movie on the platform. For it was featured yeah. too. I remember yeah. that like for yeah. a few days or that week, it was coming up when yeah. I went on Netflix. So then the Calvary came. <laughs> then you would think, then the Calvary came. <laughs> and they you're, you're tell me looked they, like they were coming. They, you they told me really they, you're telling me they didn't like, come? <laughs> no. Uh, you know, but you we, could, the were you able to... The making that movie is like, we made that movie because it was a, a, we wanted to show the world the type of movie we wished we could make. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. We, want, we wanted to be making. Um, and... Now everyone, the type of movies that people send us scripts for and that we go and have meetings on are all in the tone of, of freaks. They're all in the, the type of thing that we love to do. Um, and so that's been great, but none of those opportunities have led to anything. Um, they all might, you know, you know, you ha as a filmmaker, you've got to have like sort of 20 balls in the air of things mm -hmm. that are worth putting energy into and are fun to put energy into, but may never happen yeah. while you're continuing to keep working on your next little thing that you do control that you can make happen. So you guys raised, you ultimately, you said you started, you said you set out to like do it with whatever you had. You like were right. very certain that you were like, let's make a movie that we can make and then see what right. happens as we go. Um, right. So were you able to use once you finished that you must be working on another feature? Yeah. Yeah. So were you able to take that uh, proof of concept and parlay it into a slightly bigger larger scale production like conceptually are you still trying to do the um well let's do it for what we can you know we have different uh, still, list of resources yeah. I mean, now but basically that's what mark says in his speech is you know whatever step you're at write down all the things that you do have access to yeah how much money you have access to if if any what locations you have access to what actors you have access to and write a movie that has those things and then as soon as you're done writing you're greenlit because you've only included the things you already have that you don't yeah. need to go get. Yeah. Then once you make that movie and release that movie, even if it doesn't change the world, it will create new access to things you didn't have before you made that movie. Yeah. Either higher level crew or higher level cast or high, or more access to money or something will, will have happened having made that movie that now you can make a movie that is still f follows that list of things, of things you currently have but the things you currently have are now bigger. Um, so for us, we're still like the movie we're writing right now is still very small. Yeah. Um, but it like, it's not like we're suddenly writing a $10 million movie. Right. Um, we're still writing it within the means of 
because that gives you so much power. As soon as you write something that you can't make, you're giving the keys over to someone else yeah, to just, tell just you, great. can you make it? And then yeah. you'll be, you'll just always be suffering. So, and do, so you'll always yeah. be suffering. That sounds like you. I yeah. was just going to ask, <laughs> uh, do you, do you both co-write? And if so, what does that process look like? Yeah, well, we're, we're both very competent directors solo and we're both terrible writers solo. So having, have, I don't that know. That sounds like were. you. <laughs> I'm terrible at everything solo. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I honestly don't know how people write by themselves. I think I find writing so difficult. Uh, writing um, with a partner has always been harder for me, but yeah, he's opposite. I can sit down and like knock something out because once I sit down, I know I have the idea and I just yeah. know what it is. I have done all my thinking about it. It's all in my head and I can just, I can knock something out real quickly. Great. Adding in someone else's process <laughs> slows me down yeah and uh it's, well, it's our process it's, is very slow i'll, I'll say that our process is super me. slow yeah okay. um yeah but we you know we both are not born writers but we have yeah. a growth mind growth mindset yeah and you know we have no we we got to write this thing so we you, and you have how. to because there's nobody else to right yeah and you kind of have both, to do it yeah we both you know have slightly different skill sets he um I'm, as you would imagine, we have someone who built a scheduling and database program for shot listing. I'm a very analytical, sort of structure based type yes. brain set of like, okay, we're going to do this to set this up to get here by this page and do that. And that's sort of how my brain works. And his does as well. But he, he is more able to be more organic as well, you know, doing things like writing journals in the voice of the character or just exploring where what might happen without thinking about the yeah. structure and, and, between those two things and also just our collaboration and having the same taste, we just sort of keep throwing the ideas back and forth and, mm -hmm. and we, you know, start at an outline and then eventually a treatment and then a, um, a, a script, but something that we do that's very unusual, um, that I don't know why everyone doesn't do it because it's so massively helpful is we do okay. a, a huge, huge, huge amount of testing. Uh -huh. Um, so you we basically, at, especially at the script level yeah. um because that's the point where you haven't spent any money mm -hmm. so we take the script we get four or five actors mm -hmm. together to read it and then we get four or five people to listen to the reading mm -hmm. um and we do that over and over and over again so we we try and get to script as fast as we can we do a reading of the script knowing it's not good get everyone's feedback of what they liked what they didn't what they were confused by when was it slow all that type of stuff we go back rewrite the script almost from scratch and do it again and then yeah. get that feedback and rewrite it from scratch and do it again like on freaks we probably did that six or seven times um yeah. over the course of a year and it changed massively it went from a script that literally no one understood the first draft of freaks we thought oh we're geniuses this is so great <laughs> not a single person understood what the script what was happening in the script yeah. whatsoever because it is a mystery based thing and trying to yeah. figure out at what point to reveal the mystery was was difficult and by the end of that process you know, it was a script that agents were calling us, pitching us their actors. So that wasn't because we were brilliant writers. It was just because we went through this process of iteration where we sort of are testing, is it working? Is what yeah. is our intention happening? And then it is in some places and it isn't in others. And let's keep working on it. So it's like an intense workshopping of things. So how long did it yeah. take you? Then? How long did that take you from first That took us about to... a year. Okay. So, um, and then when we were editing, we did the same thing. So when we were editing, we edited for about three and a half, four months, and we screened the movie every weekend for, for three months uh -huh. um, to a group of five, six people. Yeah. But the same, you know, was you it would, the same group of people. Like no, every act? single. It's called that. There's Disney. a t there's a term in the video game industry that because they do the same thing called tissue testing, which is that you every time you use an audience, you throw them away like a tissue and you pull out a new one. And so you have to, um, you have to have a co completely new group of people because yeah. if if you show the movie to a bunch of people and they say, it's a really cool movie, but the first half an hour is incredibly boring, and then you edit all week, twelve hours a day for five days a week to make the beginning not boring, and then you show it to a new group of five people and they say it's a great movie, but the beginning is super boring, then and you yeah. know now that everything you did during the week didn't fix it. Whereas normally you would, you would test once, get a note, work on it, and then pat yourself on the back and be like, we did it. 
we, we fixed, fixed it. it. Yeah, Great yeah, job, everyone. But it, yeah. unless you show it to a new group of people, yeah. or in our case, we started showing it to multiple groups of people on the same weekend. We would show the movie to, because he was in LA and I was in Vancouver. So he'd show it to five people in LA. I'd show it to five people in Vancouver. And then that's really helpful because it's you, you can see where both groups overlap. How, yeah. um, how do you get the group of people? You have to pay them? I don't know. No, we just get friends. friends. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. You. It sounds like you have, have a lot of friends. I was uh, gonna say I got like, a couple. You your, your friend <laughs> actors to come in and do things for. It's like I. Well, it's, actors. I mean, I mean, you can. Actors love any opportunity to perform and to especially is, get to to, to yeah. get to know directors and yeah. and you know so actors aren't that hard. I don't think to get. You're not getting the world's best actors, but you're you, you can get actors. That's um, true. And then on the. You know, we would start with filmmakers at the very beginning. The audiences would be filmmakers because it's so rough, like especially a rough cut. You know, it doesn't yeah. quite look like a, a movie yet. Yeah. So you want people that understand yeah, what a rough, rough cut, cut is. Like, yeah. But by the end, we were showing it to, you know, my co-director's sister and all of her friends. So she would invite all her friends to come watch it. Yeah. And so at that point, the only person we know is one person. And they don't. Right. none of them even know us. And they don't yeah. know anything about filmmaking. They're just an audience. Yeah. And so you can start to get peripheral that way. And, and yeah. the thing we've noticed is filmmakers are hypercritical and basically tell you everything is wrong with it and all the ways that they would fix it, yeah. Whereas, which can be helpful. Which but be audiences, helpful. That, audiences that are just civilians are much more forgiving and give, they're like, oh, yeah, I liked it. And, you know, like, this was good. And I was a little bored here. And I didn't quite understand this yeah. thing. And that's actually closer to what the audience experience would be like. So, wow. you know, I don't think we screened our movie for more than one or like we, we'd sent out when, when we finished our feature film, it's a 90 minute uh, comedy drama thing. And we, we, we know everything that we think is wrong with it. Like our first 30 or 45 minutes, like ticks by a little slower than we think it should, yeah. but there wasn't much to do except chopping, start chopping stuff out. But we did, we sent it to friends and they watched it, gave us some notes and we had we agreed with them and did what we could with with them. And then the first time we showed it to more than a handful of people was at the casting crew premiere thing, and there was like a hundred people there. And yeah. watching it on a screen with a bunch of people, it becomes glaringly obvious <laughs> the things that you're like, oh yeah, we should not have like that in there. So we we actually went back in and once we showed it, everybody it was a it was a gracious audience. They were friends and family. It wasn't like sure. they're like, man, the film that we've been hearing about for two years is a piece of shit. They're all like congratulatory, but we're sitting there going, yeah. Yeah, th actually, this was embarrassing. This little right. thing here that nobody noticed, we noticed, and you could feel the audience. Right. You can, you can feel it's amazing things. how different it is to sit in an audience yeah. you just all the things you didn't or even the things that were at the very back of your mind that you were like eh, that's not quite right but eh, it'd be fine when you're sitting in an audience with 100 people you go oh boy that is awful we that's need to, way that, off oh yeah. yeah why are we doing this now why are we doing this to ourselves <laughs> sort of thing so yeah so we try and we basically just try and replicate that experience as many times yeah. as humanly possible Tissue and testing. then that's kind of and, a cool term too. So we're gonna start saying, "What's well, tissue testing?" That sounds yeah. a little gross too. It sounds a yeah. Gross, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we with that film, we ended up winning a lot of audience choice awards at film festivals and stuff. And that wasn't by mistake. We had tested it with audiences, yeah. you know, probably fifty times before. That's, and people wow. would come up to me and, and say, "Oh my God, I didn't know this, but then I saw this one shot." And it made me realize, oh my God, this is what's happening. And I'd go yeah. in my mind, yeah, that shot didn't exist until, you know, week <laughs> week four or five of editing until we really knew that we were screwed unless we could communicate somehow yeah. this idea. And, you know, so. That's smart. That's smart shit. That's why I love doing this show is because we, we have yeah. all these filmmakers on telling us all their good ideas. <laughs> where we can just make some notes and we don't even have to write it down. Well, it's not my idea. And... I mean, this is basically, we've copied it from Pixar. That's how Pixar makes yeah, all their movies. Yeah, that's how that's Pixar why makes all, all, their, yeah. all, their, all their movies have 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. And yeah. this is how they yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's and good. so our, our designing principle was basically, hey, could you do that if you had no money yeah. and you weren't yeah. animating it? And we basically yeah. proved that you could. Yeah. We're all just copying each other's homework. Yeah. Yeah. So, shot lister. Yeah. You're you come up with this thing, you're using it. How hard was it at first like when you started using it on your sets and your productions and stuff where people looking at you like 
keep doing like you do it the way no, we've most... always done it for the last hundred years. Like, uh, did everybody like say, the... well, "I need to, I need a piece of paper"? What are you doing? Because you need some sort of sign off on like like ads and stuff that have to use it along with you, right? Scheduling the day and stuff. Very flexible. I mean, obviously, hopefully, you've sat with your ads before you've gotten. To yeah, 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 and, yeah. And gone over how much time you need for what. Um, and I sit with them and go through every single shot and what order and with how much time. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you know, crew is always extremely grateful, and um, you know, Shotlister now has the ability to share the the crew list live. But yeah. most, what I do now, um, we started doing the last two years, which has been really helpful. Is we will export a PDF of the day, which is still a, an unmovable, you know, unchangeable document. You know, yeah. it doesn't have the flexibility that because the whole part of Shotlister that's cool is you can change it as you're going. Because things yeah. are always going to change, you know, based on what happens. And so, yeah. um, we've started sharing that with crew, and they release it with the call sheet. Um, and crew are so thankful. You see the, the camera operators looking through it. You see the gaffer looking through it. They get a sense of when you know certain gear is going to be needed and stuff. Yeah. Um, and how long their day? Directors. Be. <laughs> yeah, and directors are very usually. There's this. I don't know why. I have never subscribed to this, but I know that most a lot of directors at least the the more traditional directors are very 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 secretive about their shot list and their plan i think i think it it comes down to not wanting people to know that they're behind or something oh, yeah, yeah um whereas i think it creates transparency of information creates so much way more benefits of like hey guys yeah. here's the plan yeah. hey guys we're now an hour behind so we gotta we gotta start yeah clearing this out and making different changes. And the biggest thing is once you start working with producers, their biggest concern by far is, you know, how much cost is going to happen from going over. And their biggest fear is that you're unaware of it and that you don't have a plan to make the day. And so if you're not sharing your, yeah, yeah, or that you don't care, if you don't share your shot list or you don't share your plan, it just makes the producer even more nervous. Whereas if you do share the plan and you say, look, here's the plan, we're going to do this, then this, then this, and we're going to get rid of this and we're going to move this to tomorrow. And that's what we're going to do. The producer just relaxes and just says, okay, great, go do it. And they, 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 they have so much more trust in you. Um, so from a, basically from a crew and producer standpoint, I've only had glowing, Mm -hmm. you know, glowing feedback and, and filmmakers around the world that I get emails from basically just saying like, I don't know how I ever made a movie before this without oh, this. Yeah. Cause it's, cause it kind of gives you like a visual of where you're at and what's left to do and helps you figure out a way to get the most important stuff and get rid of yeah. the, the less important stuff. When you are looking at like we, that day that Brad was talking about on our, on our set, we were shooting far too much than we should have. We, we, uh, we showed up that day and it was like the, the big climatic moment of our thing. And it was a party scene. So we had like, we ultimately had like 15 or 18 people that showed up to be guests at a party yeah. and we knew that we had to get all of that on that one day because those same people weren't going to show up tomorrow yeah. or next week or a month from now right. they were going to they were going to that we ultimately knew at the end of the day they were going to regret coming out to help us because it was going to be <laughs> four o'clock in the morning before anybody got to leave but we're yeah. like thanks for coming here we like yeah. literally threw a pizza party you guys yeah. are supposed to be party, so sit there and eat that pizza while we work, <laughs> while we walk around for six hours and 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 yeah. mad hatter every little thing we need. Right. We had seventy six shots on our shot list, yeah. which we knew. I, I like it's weird because you knew we knew going in, it's like we're not going to get all this. We'll figure out what we can and can't get, and we ultimately, we so it was like eighteen pages of the script. Wow. We real ultimately. Uh, I mean, uh, it sounds braggadocious, but I'm saying the same. It was a stupid fucking idea to try to do it. <laughs> but we just knew with we knew we weren't gonna. We needed to get as much as we could that one day. My shot list was insane. I had like a whole thing drawn out, drawn written out, and everything. Uh, when did shot list? When was it? What year was that? Shot we should have been using probably. Shot. Yeah, probably. At least by 2013, I think. Maybe oh God! Better. You'd been around. Yeah. You'd been around for about two we years. I was sitting there. I was sitting there in my old school methods. Um, so, but just having a shot list on paper, I tell my students all the time, like just having it on paper, so you can draw a line through. You can actually see your progress throughout the day. But also, if you have it figured out, you know what you can cut and what you can move around. Doing that on paper with like 
we ultimately got about 30 or 40 shots that day. And it was literally handheld. Say it again. Yeah. Like a yeah. Drive, you yeah. Know, yeah. It was Running like down. that. So, yeah. so I say shots and it's like, it's not like we had 50 yeah. setups or anything. But um, trying to figure out where to cut, what to cut when there was sat that much on paper of what to do was, 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 was impossible. Um, no, well, not impossible yeah, well, I think because the biggest, we, we, we did it, but, um, in, in a lot of ways, I think shot listers biggest benefit isn't while you're shooting, it's while you're prepping Yeah. because while you're prepping, you, you list all the shot, all the shots in your mind in, in the, it has basically two modes as scene mode and, and shoot day mode. When you're in scene mode, you just list, okay, this is the scene. And then we're going to shoot this, 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 you, you list everything just creatively. Then in the shoot day mode, you're adding those shots to a day mm-hmm. and estimating how long you're going to spend on each one Yeah, 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 um, yeah. based on, ba- and it adds it all up. So yeah. at the end you'll say, Oh wow, this is, <laughs> if I, if I spend 20 minutes on every shot, that's going to be 16 hours. Well, <laughs> we don't have 16 hours. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. What if I combine these and get rid of this? And, and yeah. you go through that experience before you even get to the set. Um, and that saved me so many times. There's been times on big shows where I'm, you know, doing a television series and we've same thing. We've got our big action scene with 30 ninjas showing up and like explosions and all this stuff. And I do the shot list and I even make, there was this time where I made the most bare bones shot list I could, but, but just like covering the basics of what the showrunner wanted in it. Yeah. And it was still going to be a 14 hour day and I knew they weren't going to do 14 hours. And I, I, I could show them there's no way of doing all of these stunt beats in less than 14 hours yeah. unless we get a third camera team. Yeah. If we get a, uh, if we get a third camera team, I can shoot this and this at the same time, this and this at the same time, blah, blah, blah. And so with, and this was on like a Saturday and we were shooting it on Monday. So on yeah. the weekend, they were able to get a third camera team together yeah. and we made that day. But I wouldn't have known that, you know, unless I went through that process. And so yeah. it can be super helpful. Every oh, yeah. plus, I mean, a plus you get the director gets to be right. Directors love being right. And uh, <laughs> everybody's like, this fucking director thinks he's always right. And then you show up with your documentation. You're like, this, look right here. And they're like, fuck, the director's right. Um, well, because like I, it, on lower in lower budget indie stuff, in general, the crew is very supportive of the director. Yeah. But as you start working through higher ranks and bigger budgets, um, it quick, I don't know why, but quickly the crew often is because everyone thinks that they should be the director once, like once you're on a bigger thing. And, and I think a lot of people could be directors, but in yeah. a lot of cases, they're sort of looking for opportunities to prove that they should be a director and yeah. that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so, you know, you have to counteract that with being overly prepared and yeah. showing how competent you are. And so when you show up with yeah. these types of details, it, it's very hard for the crew to <laughs> to make it look like you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So you know what else he's got, Brad? You will love this. It, is it part? Of, you've got the uh, the script reader app. Yeah. This this, uh, this thing <laughs> this thing will read a script to you, Brad. I just oh, I, we, I need that. We're working on a script right now. I wrote the yeah. first draft. Brad needs. Yeah. To, I had Brad to do text to does speak. Does not for like, the whole thing. but he was using. I kept text having to, to fast forward it because it would lose its place, and I'm like, I got to spend right. 20 minutes getting back to where I was. This thing right. goes through, and it's and it reads the. It doesn't go int bop. Blah, blah. It, oh, it, yeah. it says interior. It's what's Cont day. And then Cont it, yeah. <laughs> continue. Right. Yeah. 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 Cont yeah. Continue. But it says when the character's name comes up, it goes, Becca Meyer says, blah, blah, blah. And then it says the oh. line. And it's almost, it's real close to sounding oh like God. an audio book, like, like a narrator reading an yeah, audio book. so it's oh. called, um, I know, I'm, I'm not, I've never been a very good reader. I have, I don't think I have dyslexia, but I have some sort of extremely mild version of, of basically like reading yes. is actually is, is very difficult for me it, yes, um, and too. very sl- slow for me and Ugh. um Ugh. and i mix up dates and all that type of stuff okay. so anyway you get it. <laughs> but i love audiobooks and i love podcasts yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. um so yeah we built this thing it's called script speaker scriptspeaker.com mm-hmm. you can go to mm-hmm. it right now oh. and we yes. basically built an algorithm where you drop in a a, a pdf or a fountain file it melts it and then goes through and it knows the syntax of scripts so it it changes all the abbreviations into words and it adds says after each character and and does all that type of stuff and then we've plugged it into amazon poly which is i think the best by far the best speech synthesis available Uh um and it has incredibly natural sounding voices and then basically renders it it takes a while it takes maybe like 
10 minutes or 20 minutes to okay. render a, a full script. Right. Because we, we send it to Amazon. They have their giant server process, you know, yeah, the, beep up million, yeah, yeah. The, the million characters. And then they send us back an MP3 and then we give you the MP3. And so then you can, you know, oh, listen man. to that wherever you want to listen to You MP3. saved five, my five life. Five bucks a month. I can actually <laughs> read all the scripts you've sent me. Yeah. It's five bucks a month, right? Five dollars yeah. a month? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, he I've gets, sent I've sent him scripts of things that we have shot and he's never read. Right. I I have to put it off until we're actually going to be doing it yeah. before I have to force myself to do it. And I just recently figured yeah. out text to speech. Yeah. And now I can read them all. Yeah. And it's yeah. pleasant. To, it's pleasant because sometimes I have friends that will send me scripts too, and it's hard for me to get to them because I'm busy working and day, day, right. day job, just life. Yeah. But. I have thought about doing text to speech in my car, but I just know that the the experience of that is not is not ple- is not going to be yeah. pleasant. Yeah. So I just I mean, kind of like don't read the script. <laughs> the, the voices are pretty good. It does take a little bit of attention. Like you, yeah. whenever you're listening to someone who's reading something, especially a computer who's reading it, these are very good voices. But there is still voice. sort of there still is sort of the same tone, yeah. you know, yeah. all the way through. So it you, your your mind your mind can drift. You do have to sort of yeah. listen to it with intent. Yeah. But I've found, you know, if you're going for a walk or you're driving or you're doing something where yeah. um, your body's sort of doing one thing, your mind almost has an easier ability to listen to this other thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I've even done it. I'm a very, I'm not sure if everyone's this way, but I can do very, very detailed things that are visual while mm-hmm. still having my entire audio side of my brain empty. So like I can be designing a website or concept art or, or doing um, any type of sort of visual thing with complete concentration while also listening to something with complete yeah, concentration. Yeah, I have hard time so, with that, but I know people So often I do often I do two things. Like if I know I need to do a bunch of concept art for some pitch, I'll open up Photoshop and start doing that while listening to a script. And, yeah. um, and it ends up working really well. So is that part that's, is that, are you packaging those two things together? Are they completely separate? You started no, another totally whole separate. other startup. Yeah, Scripps, well, they're both under our own, this one company. Scripps right. Speaker um, right now is just a website, so it doesn't have yeah. an app. It's just, okay. a, you just go to the, you just go to the site yeah. and, um, and you can play it from there or log on. You can, you can use it from your phone if you just use the browser, but it doesn't have its own yeah. app. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just its own thing that, again, it was just, I was using all those text to voice programs and I was going through and like I would melt the PDF and then I would find and replace int to interior and then find and replace exterior yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and then find and replace content into thing and then like, <laughs> you know, and then, yeah. you know, <laughs> and so that just got so frustrating because I was like, I'm spending 25 minutes to convert a script to yeah. then listen to it with this shitty voice. I'd rather just yeah. pay someone to build this from scratch. And so I did. Yeah. So is there, do you, is, does, do you have to like pay per thing you do or it's, how does it work? A, it's a month, $5. Yeah. So basically okay. five bucks yeah. a month and you can do as many as you want a month. Okay, yeah. So I'll just cram them all in one month. And... Yeah, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> no, if it, but, uh, if, but if it's but... helpful, it's, you know, I basically, that one, more than any, I literally just built for myself. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. any other person who uses it, great. Yeah, uh, but, but you but you know you know that if you have that issue, st- a certain amount of people are also going to have that issue, that same issue. Yeah. So uh, do you, can you download the MP3s to your own yeah. self? Yes. Yeah, so you download them so you listen to them on your own time, put them in yeah. a player so you can start and pause and all that stuff. Yeah. You yeah, can that's... also do it like if you go to the site from your phone, you can just hit yeah. play from the browser. But if you want to, I often I just have a folder in Dropbox, so I just drop yeah. them all into there, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. then you know. That way you can do it because often because in Dropbox you can download it offline and just have it offline. Yeah. I was just thinking it might be easier to have other people read it. So, hey, could you listen to my script as opposed to would can yeah. you sit down right. and read this whole thing? Yeah, we so just... we have a we have an ability in there. You can actually share a link, sort of like a Dropbox yeah. link or yeah, yeah, yeah. A, or a Google Drive link to the file, so that you can send it to people that way. We did. We just talked to a person. Uh, uh, about fi- film financing and he said one of the things some of the filmmakers he's worked he's 
he he helps people through and some of the people he's talked to have produced almost like an audio play version of the screenplay instead of handing them the script that yeah. most people a lot of people don't know how to read it's not it's not you know anyway yeah. um but, but i was i was think when i first heard that uh your thing i thought this might be able to work is that you can pass it off as an mp3 or you can do both you can say here's this here's the pdf and here's the audio file yeah 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 Cool. So I have one more question about your shot lister. How yeah. is, do you feel like industry adoption happening? Do you, I know you just, you mentioned you yeah, have a lot of filmmakers uh, sending you, you know, uh, positive reviews through their emails, but. Yeah, it's definitely, it's grown every year. Um, you know, when I was first starting it, you know, it was just as the iPad was coming out and I like gave a speech at the DGA and everyone was like, you know, what's, <laughs> What's an iPad? Why would I yeah, yeah. want to change? This is why would I want to change? That's that yeah. just the end right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but obviously, a lot of a lot has changed since then, and now yeah. filmmakers are using lots of apps, and and uh, even the old school guys are are becoming digital, and so we've seen a lot of adoption. Um, the you know we've we've had tens of thousands of people use the app. Um, mm. uh, it's the, the goal for me was always just that it's sustainable enough to to keep the team of people that it takes to keep it running. Because yeah. unfortunately, with software, you know, I would say ninety percent of our income goes to just keeping it working. Yeah. Because of all the different app updates and device changes and APIs, or it's like just keeping it the base of what it does working it takes a team of three people like working all the time. All the time. And so, um, and so, luckily, it pays for that. And a little bit more and then as that little bit more grows we then build a new feature yeah and um you know it's been growing steadily and we get really great emails from people um yeah i just got an email from a company i can't mention but uh they're from a galaxy far far away saying hey could we use this <laughs> program uh you know it would be really cool and we're yeah. like yes please here you go <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll send you a, a copy <laughs> so do you, let, do you have um does it work in uh i cannot remember if there's like a group share like you can share a project that's and, what i was you gonna have ask, collaborators working because i same. i bought a thing and and i wanted him to help me because he was uh yeah. you know do, he's my ad producer everything and i wanted him to be able to but we couldn't do it at the time uh, unless I think we had to have the same login or something. Or, no, time. you. I think you we... had to get an account and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It... So I yeah. Guess so basically, me... the that is one area we're hoping to improve. It is possible. It's just not effortless right now. Basically, yeah, yeah. you can. Um, we have something called CrewSync that allows mm -hmm. um, what we call the author to share the the shot list with anyone, um, and the iOS app is free. So if you had Crew. They can download the iOS app for free, and they can log yeah. in for free, and they can just have a copy of the shot yeah. list on their yeah. on their app, which they can't change. It's basically just, you know, if you want them to be able to see it they as you're changing it. Yeah. it. That's what. Um, we that's what we yeah, want. Yeah. 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 You can also share authorship with other people, um, if you wanted other people to be able to change the shot list. Yeah. Um, but it isn't. It's not foolproof because basically right now, um, if if I whenever you hit publish it's it's sort of publishing the whole project so it's not great basically what it doesn't work for is two people changing it at the same time right um right. what it what it works well for is right now i'm changing it okay i'm done now you change it okay now mm. i'll change it and now i'm done yeah. now you, sort of like yeah. how do documents used to be um it doesn't have the the google drive of like the, the we're google both editing drive. the same we don't have that yet but we're working on it so you okay. know that that that's great, though. It's like, um, that's something that, that was a problem that didn't even exist, like, in the 80s, 90s, even into the 2000s, it was like, I'll send you the thing, you'll work on it, and send it back to me. That's just how it was. Right. Um, right. Now, and Google Documents came in and ruined it for everybody. Right. Like, right. Final Draft, I think, finally had a right. feature where you can collaborate in sync at the same time. Yeah. I, I haven't used the new version of the software yet, but... but Google Documents did that, and everybody's like, "Well, why doesn't everybody do that?" And you're like, "Well, shit! Right. Now we got to all to and it's, fix it." And it's very, and it's very, very complicated. I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, and so, um, yeah, when we first yeah. built the app, it was sort of in the early days of back when you would sort of send a file back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. And yeah. now to undo that and rebuild it so that two people can change it at the same time is complicated, but it's something we're working on. So. 
That's cool. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you. I, we really appreciate you coming on yeah. talking to us. And thank I, you for solving uh, all our problems. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you for helping us solve that problem. <laughs> it really is. And I, I love the fact when I, when I put two and two together and realized, oh, the, the guy who did Shotlister is a filmmaker using it. Like I, you know, that you were just solving a problem. Yeah. For, for well, for yourself, but in general, like you're like this is a practical problem. Or an issue that needs to be solved, and I really liked it. Plus, I like talking to you about movies, so it was uh, it was, <laughs> it was sure. good. Thank you for coming on and talking to us. Well, uh, thanks for getting the word want, out there. Where do you want people to go to find you or Shotlister or your movies or sure. like, what are you telling uh, people? Well, you should check out Freaks. It's on it's on Netflix, uh, and uh, it's I guarantee you'll have a good time. Um, it's a but don't look <laughs> don't look up anything about the movie. It's it's it's. The, it's a really great movie to go into knowing absolutely nothing, nothing. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but don't worry, it's not too scary. If you're if you're not into horror films, it's not not too scary. I don't think it's not a horror film. It's more of a, a dark thriller, thriller, uh, mystery mystery film. Um, so check out Freaks. Uh, I think you'll like it. Uh, you can find me Zach Kupovsky on Instagram and other places. Um, and then Shotlister, you can find at shotlister.com and script speaker. You can find at scriptspeaker.com. And, uh, both of those are on Instagram and Twitter and stuff as well. Um, yeah. And Shotlister is free on iOS. So you can download it right now and start, you can, the free version, you can build shot lists and all that type of stuff. Yeah. You just can't share it, share it with other people. So, oh, okay. so um, you can see how it functions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would say 90% of Shotlister is free on iOS, fully functional. You can, you could make a whole film on the free version. Um, it has a few limiting things, like you can't have lots of projects, you can't add storyboards, you can't share with other people, like sort of there's some pro features that are that need a subscription, but the vast majority yeah. of it you could use for free. Awesome, that's that's cool. Well, yeah. every now and then, I was just saying to Brad right before, it's like, it's one of those days where it's like a Saturday and I worked <laughs> all, all week and like yeah. I, I was up late working on stuff and I, and I had to get blood work this morning and I went running <laughs> and I just sat down and realized that I'd already, that I was like already exhausted. I'm like, oh, you're man. done for the day. And, that I was done for the day. And, I, and in my mind, I was just like, and I, and I said this to Brad, I said, uh, man, I just, man, you ever like that thing where you're always working and you're like, sometimes yeah. I just want to be blissfully ignorant and have a Saturday off. But yeah. I also I said, every, every, <laughs> every time we every time we say that it's we always have a great conversation with somebody. Yeah, we feel because, better. After. Well, I feel rejuvenated from talking to you. So yeah. now I'm excited awesome. again. Yeah, yeah. Great. So thanks. The filmmakers like, like talking a little nerdy, film. nerdy film shit does you it's know like, doesn't yeah. get everybody excited. But I you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. If you want to get in touch with us, we are Becca Meyer and Balding Ewok on. Instagram, all that stuff. You can find us on Discord, which we're starting up now. Uh, Super Mega Ultra, hashtag 7516. That's it. Send us an email at filmereverypodcast at gmail.com. We're Super Mega Ultra everything. Everywhere. Super Mega Ultra everything. Yeah. All right. We'll see you again next time. That's it. Thank you. Go make something. Cut. The end. Oh, you gotta say your that's thing. how it goes. Oh, no. no it's the, the end. end. All right. All right. <laughs>